Okay, now let me share. Because I do have some things today to. Okay. All right, everybody, welcome back. I hope you had a good Easter. All right. Everybody have a good Easter? I did. I got to see all my grandkids. I spend the day with them. That was fun. That was fun. So today we're going to go start back into our Bible study. Um, and we are going to focus on uh, Jesus moving from Capernaum back to um, Judea. And we're going to begin with the call of the disciples, right? And so before we do that, Linda had asked once more to have a kind of a, a uh, discussion of the four gospel writers uh, and how they approach their gospel accounts. And I think that's valuable because where we are today, um, we're going to be in the first chapter of Mark, the eighth chapter of Matthew, the fourth chapter of Luke. So they have all are looking at and have developed this uh, gospel account in a specific manner related to how they wanted to express the good news and the gospel of Jesus, right? So it, it, we can start with just basically going through uh, and talking about each of the four of them. And today we're only gonna talk, uh, we're, we are gonna talk briefly about John, but uh, mostly the synoptic gospel. So the three synoptic gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, right? Uh, you're, we're going to see that Mark is going to be the most succinct of the gospel writers. Mark, Mark's, Mark wants to get the message out, the story out, right? So we're going to see today when we talk about his call of the disciples, it's still in his first chapter. He's going to skip over um, John the Baptist. He's going to almost skip over the baptism. He, he's going to He's going to get right into the meat of Jesus Christ and get Jesus Christ to the cross, right, and the resurrection. And then we have Luke, Luke the physician. Right? So we're in Luke. We're going to get more of, if, if we want to look at it from a, if, if you try to put it in a perspective, a, view, a viewport, if you will, right, Mark is a, Mark is the, looking at it as the historical viewpoint, viewport, right? Let me give you the history. Let me tell you what happened. Let me give you the facts, right? We don't need to deal with everything that happened behind the facts. So here's just the facts. Luke, on the other hand, being a physician, looks at Christ as the man who walked earth. Divine, no doubt in Luke's mind that Christ is divine, but his images of him and how he talks about him are from the perspective of how he deals with humankind, right? So much as a physician would look at anything, right? From the eyes of a physician, you know, he looks at Christ as that, that person who heals, comforts, and does all the things that we would do as human beings, right? Then there's Matthew. And Matthew looks at Jesus from a very, uh, the, the term that I see and, and read everywhere is Christocentric. Everything about Matthew's gospel account centers on Jesus and what Jesus does and what Jesus believes and what Jesus, why Jesus was sent and what he accomplishes, okay? And then lastly, you have the fourth evangelist, the 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 fourth writer, John, who looks at Jesus from almost purely a divine perspective, okay? Think, think for a moment about John's gospel account. How does it start, right? It starts with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, right? So he talks about Christ from the very beginning, being of God and the Word of God, in the in the incarnation of the word in the world, right? Very divine in his perspective. Okay. Does that help, Linda? Okay. All right. Okay. So let's talk a little bit. When we left, right? When we left our study, um, 
which was what, six weeks ago? I don't even remember leaving, it was so long ago. All right. When we left our study, Jesus had just finished his ministry in Capernaum. We were in Luke. We were in the fourth chapter of Luke. And Luke is talking about the last thing that we talk about is what? The healing of Peter's mother-in-law, correct? Jesus goes to the house of Peter. Peter's mother-in-law is ill. Jesus heals her to the point that the gospel writers say to us, she got up and served them. It was that much, it was that quick of a healing. It was that full of a he, fullness of a healing that she got up and immediately served them, right? And then it says that Jesus had to uh, teach outside of the cities because he was drawing so many people and that he left Galilee and went to Judea, okay? So, in other words, his ministry in Capernaum was over, and now where is he going? Right? He's going to Jerusalem. Right? That's how quick we're going to move there. Okay? So now, interesting enough, when we get to the fifth chapter of Luke, he's still in Galilee. He hasn't left yet. Right? Because so far in Luke, Jesus has been doing everything by himself, right? We at, we at no point so far really have any react, uh, interaction with the disciples other than Peter, right? And so there's some, we make some intuitive thoughts about that because we know the whole gospel and say, well, yes, Peter, the disciple, He's been called by Jesus to be a fisherman. And so therefore he's in Capernaum because that's where Peter lives. And that's why Jesus had to go to Peter's house and his mother-in-law was sick and he healed her. And so we make that assumption. But in fact, the call comes in five, chapter five of Luke, okay? So let's talk a minute about what's really great about our study that we're doing now is the call to Peter and Mark comes in the first chapter, okay, toward the end of the first chapter, and in Luke it comes at the beginning of the fifth. So let's think for a moment, why? Why is that, okay? So in Mark, keep in mind how Mark starts, right? Mark gets almost immediately to healing and teaching and then to the disciples. For Luke, it is important that we first understand who the Christ is, why he was sent, what he's going to do. And then after we understand all of that, for Luke, maybe it's really not about this point in time, it's about who he was writing for. So keep, keep in mind, when was this written? When was Luke written? Lisa Andrews. 60s, 70s, right? Is what, is what most scholars believe, 60s, 70s. So what does that mean? Who is Luke writing this gospel account for? The first century church, right? And what is the first century church? Think for a moment. The first century church is a bunch of individuals who are either living by the stories that they've heard or the things that they've seen, right? And are still expecting that Christ is coming back any day, right? Because we're only not many years past the resurrection, okay? And so Luke is writing his gospel account so that those individuals understand that they are called to be disciples, okay? So when we talk about the call of the disciples in Luke, maybe it's important that we have four chapters of Luke that set the stage for us and say, 
Here's John the Baptist come wandering out of the wilderness. And this is what he was preaching. And he baptized Jesus in the river Jordan. And when Jesus would baptize, the dove descended from heaven, settled on his shoulders, and God said, what? This is my son, right? And then he goes on and begins his ministry. And he teaches and he heals, right? And then after, for Luke, we understand who Jesus is and why he was sent and what he does. Then Luke calls his disciples. Then Luke has Jesus call his disciples. And maybe that's because he wanted all of those people in first century Jerusalem to understand you're called as well. It's not just the 12, it's all of you. And here's why you're called, right? So if you were to, if you were to go to Mark's account and go to the call, you wouldn't get that same sense of why you were called, would you? No, but we get it in Luke, right? So Luke gives us that sense in the materials that he, he reads for us, all right? So let's go, picking up in, did we, did we do 442, Joyce? Okay, so we're starting in 5-1? Starting in 5-1. Ma'am? No, I'm good. So it was, and the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Genesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. Stop there. So Jesus, now after the healing of Peter's mother and all of the things that he's done, he can't even stay in the city because the crowds are too large. Right. So there are two things we really see in Luke. And one thing that we see from Luke is that is a is an example of who the Christ was. And it's also an example to each of us of things that we need to do. And that is that Jesus oftentimes had to get away, didn't he? Right? How many times do we read in Luke that Jesus went off by himself to pray? Even here, even here in this story, Jesus separates himself from the crowds, right? Now, there's probably two reasons for that. One is if you're on the beach, right, for all of you beach lovers, right? If you're on the beach and there's a throng of people, the people at the back are not going to see you because you're all at the same level, right? So if he gets in the boat and moves away from shore, that there's an angle change. So more people can see him and he can see more people. You get that? Right? That's the architect in me. Okay, so, so that's a reason. And also I believe a reason is he needed to separate himself. It says there was a throng. That's not just a big crowd. That's a pressing crowd, isn't it? I mean, it, it, you almost visualize being squeezed in by this massive crowd. So he got into the boat and pushed away from shore to be separated. Okay? Now, this is the only time that specifically the lake is located by an adjacency. Okay? And it says to us here, that he stood by the lake of Genesaret. Okay. Now, Josephus, if you read Josephus, will use that name, right? But this is the only time that we hear it called that here in this, in this setting, okay? Then he got into the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out from a little, and he sat down and he taught the multitude. So let's talk a little bit about fishermen, Sea of Galilee, right? Uh, Harold's not here. Is Harold on? I'm telling you, I'm going to quit doing photographs. All right, I'm going to do photographs. Y'all can tell him. There are three types of fish in the Sea of Galilee. Right? 
There's a cichlidae, which is a panfish, and there are many varieties of panfish. And actually today there's a panfish in the Sea of Galilee that's called Peterfish. It's named after Peter, the Peterfish, right? The second is um, cichlidae, and that's basically a carp, all right? And the third fish that's in the Sea of Galilee is a cerulidae, which is a catfish, okay? So at that time in Palestine, uh, fish was the major protein. So they ate a lot of fish and it mostly came from the Sea of Galilee, right? Now, they wouldn't eat catfish because it had no scales. So Leviticus tells us, right? You can't eat fish without scales. So Jews would not eat catfish, correct, Ron? That is correct. So one of the three fish species in the sea of, do I? That's too bad because it's really good. But uh, so, so one of the three species in the Sea of Galilee was not available to eat. So they either ate carp, which I would not eat personally, right? That's not my favorite fish, or they would eat panfish, which I would eat, right? So uh, fishing was a major, major thing first century in the Sea of Galilee, okay? And it says, they were washing their nets. So just a little more trivia for you, right? There were three types of nets used primarily in um, first century. Many of them are still used by Arab fishermen today. All right, so you will see those. And the first is cast nets. I have the Hebrew here. I'm not going to pronounce it, but it's there for you. If you, you know, it's easier to say cast nets. Um, but everybody pretty much knows what a cast net is. It's primarily a wading device, right? Not many people use them out of a boat. They're big round nets that you throw and then you pull tight and you're primarily gonna catch smaller fish, excuse me, smaller fish or bait in them, okay? The second is a trammel net. And a trammel net is a, actually a series of nets. It's a bigger net that has an internal smaller mesh net that is where it catches the fish and the fish funnel into this smaller area and um, and are caught in the, so this is one drying on the left and one full of fish on the right, right? It does not look, is this one working? Can everybody see that one? I'm sorry, I don't know what happened there. This is an old television. It might be finally losing its point. And so you can see it's a big net, right? And then the last net that's used were drag nets. Drag nets today are the primary net used by shrimpers. And so if you're, if you're down in Galveston and you see them shrimping and those big nets that come down out off the, off the boats, those are drag nets. So they're massive nets, right? Um, most scholars believe that the net that was being used in the gospel accounts by Simon, Andrew, John, James were trammel nets. They were easier, they're easier to handle, right? They're, and they're, because there were no mechanisms to pull in big nets like we have now on, on uh, shrimp boats and things like that, okay? So probably a trammel net. Okay. All right. Now, I, I want to, I'm going to jump a little bit because this is, uh, and it might be hard for me to find it. So I might have someone read for me. Can someone read for me? And I, and I would prefer someone that's online. That way we can all hear it. Um, read for me, John. Hang on, sorry. 22nd chapter of John. Go there. The gospel. I do. 21, sorry. 21, 1 through 14. Somebody online read that for me.
Amber? I'm, I'm trying to find it, Somebody. but in the Bible we've got, that's not so easy. <laughs> Let me see what I just, if I have my regular Bible, I can read it. I'm, look, I'm looking it up. Okay. Can you read it real loud? John 21, let's say 1246. I'm still working on it. It's on 1246. Yeah. Can you, you come but... up here to the speaker real quick? And I hope that I'm coming to the right verses. Or you get to read it twice. Did you get mine? Okay. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. Is that right? Mm -hmm. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And they did. They were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him where he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals where the, with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came back, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So I wanted to read that because if we continue to read in Luke in the fifth chapter, now, I have time replacing. All right. Let me get, let me read, and then we're going to come back. When he stopped speaking, he said to Simon, "Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch." But Simon answered and said to him, "Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net." And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down to Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. All right? So now I want you to think for a moment. One of these events, this one in Luke that we're reading now, is Simon's all to be a disciple. Okay? It begins with Jesus coming to the Sea of Galilee. It is in the middle as a miracle, a great catch. And then lastly will be the call. Now, in the gospel account of John that Lisa just read, this is a post-resurrection appearance. Right? So was it said? Right? It's the same story, though, isn't it? Think for a moment. Jesus walks through the Sea of Galilee. They've been fishing all night. They've caught nothing. Right? The only difference being that they are still on the water in John, and they had already come in in Luke. Jesus calls out to them and says, what? Put down your net. In Luke, he says, go out into the deep and put down your nets. In John, he says, put down your net 
and they in both respond, but we fished all night and have caught nothing. And then comes the miracle of the catch, doesn't it? And in Luke, the miracle of the catch is so great that it rips the nets and it sinks the boats. And in John, the miracle of the catch is so great that the nets are still strong and they're able to work. Right? So the question then for scholars is, when did this event happen? Is this a post-resurrection event that Luke incorporates into his gospel account because it, it helps us transition from Capernaum to Jerusalem through the call? Or was it a calling event that John, the fourth evangelist, used in a post-resurrection appearance? Okay, all right. So Linda says it's two events that are identical, but one, they're two different calls of the disciples. Okay, all right. She says the second one in John is a reinforcement. And I say to you, I don't care. All right, because the message here is, right, let's go back to Luke. The message here from Luke is we are called to be disciples, right? And even when we believe that we failed through the Christ, we can't fail. Right? They fished all night, haven't they? Right? Now, normally, normally, right, fishing is a thing of the tides. I don't know how many fishermen fisher people or whatever the term is. It's, it's, it's the cycles of the moon and the tides that cause fishing to be what it is, right? And it's because when there's a lot of tide, there's a lot of bait movement. And when there's a lot of bait movement, there's a lot of fish. Right? So the fact that they had fished all night long and they were in and they were cleaning their boats and they were uh, ruining the day that they wasted, you know, all night long with no fish. Probably if they went back out, they weren't going to catch him. Okay. Thus Peter's response. But I tell you, we've been out all night and we caught nothing. Right? So what is, what is the point of Luke's telling us? The point of Luke's telling us is if we listen to the Christ, Right? He calls us to do things, and he calls us to do things and make sure that we can do them. Well, and I don't think it's, and it's not just that, Linda. It, it is, we are, we are easily disappointed. We are easily set aside. Peter says, we fished all night, right? It's not going to do us any good to go back out there, right? And isn't that the way we are? Lisa. Exactly. Exactly. Exactly, right? He says, he says, we fished all night. I know in my own mind as a fisherman that I can go back out there and I'm not going to catch anything, but I trust you, right? I trust you. Now, those are the same words, Lisa, that we're going to hear next with the leper. The leper is going to come to Jesus and say, I know you can heal me. Not if, not will you heal me, not if you will heal me, I know you can. That's all trust, isn't it? And that's where Peter was. And, and even with Peter, it's not only that trust, but it's trust. It, Luke tells us even more 
than just trust. When he says to us, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees and said, what? Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Peter trusts Jesus knowing that he's not perfect himself. If, if you want to take something from what Luke's telling first century Christians, right? You want to take something from what Luke is telling 21st century Christians? It is we can trust Christ because we know that he is perfect even when we aren't. Right? We can trust. And obey. That's why they wrote a song about it. You got to do the second half. We could we could be Peter and trust and not get back in our boat. But then we get back in our boat and throw down the nets. And what happens when we throw down the nets? We catch so many fish that our boats are sinking. Right? Now, going back to my comparison of Luke and John, the statement that Peter makes and Luke is also very fitting of a statement that Peter would make post-resurrection. Okay. Because Peter knew by post-resurrection that he had denied the Christ three times. So did he know that he was a sinful man? Yes, right? So it could it could go in both places. All right? Okay, so let's keep moving forward. Picking up in verse, for he and all who were with him were ostracized, uh, astonished, ostracized, astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. All right. So Luke's account of the calling. Now, let's talk a little bit about um, in the Greek, the Greeks, uh, first century Greeks used the metaphor of catching men. They used that metaphor to talk about how they would gather men and women together uh, to, um, to get them into Greek philosophy and Greek society. Old Testament, right? We, throughout the Old Testament, see the same metaphor. So this metaphor of catching men, being fishers of men, is not something that was just new to the New Testament. It's something that everyone that studied Torah in the first century would have understood from Old Testament readings. It, was a, it had been around for a long time, right? So when Jesus says to Peter, I'm going to make you fishers of men, it was then from Old Testament, it, would, it meant we are going to gather men and women together for the judgment. Right? And here in this context, it is to gather men and women together for the kingdom. Okay? So that's what he's fishing for. He's just not going out and pick, gathering men and women. He's gathering them for the kingdom. Okay? Questions? We all right? Okay. Let's move. Matthew 8. First through the fourth verses of Matthew. All right? So we're going to do, we're going to do Matthew. I'm going to probably read, let me see how many Luke's. I'm going to read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then we're going to talk about all of them. So Matthew 8, 1 through 4, Mark 1, 40 through 45, Luke 5, 12 through 16. Okay? So here we go. When he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him, and behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I'm willing to be cleansed. 
Immediately the leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you tell no one, but go your way, show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. That's Matthew's account, okay? Here's Mark's, chapter one, verse 40. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand, touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once and said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. However, he went out and began to proclaim in it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in deserted places. And they came to him from every direction. Right? And then in Luke, in the fifth chapter, the 12th verse, and it happened when he was in a certain city that behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus and he fell on his face and implored him saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him, charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. However, the report went around concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. All right, so let's talk a little bit. Leprosy, leprosy as we read in New Testament, as we read in Old Testament, is one, it is a overarching classification for skin disease. It is not leprosy that we know as Hansen's disease, which is where we classify leprosy today, which is a terminal, that's terminal, right? Okay. This was all kinds of skin conditions. Okay. According to Leviticus and New Deuteronomy, if you had leprosy, you had to live alone. You had to stay, you could not get within X feet of any other individual. And you, the first thing that you had to say when you approached an individual was unclean, unclean. All right. So those were the rules. And so you had leper colonies, if you will, of individuals who had these skin diseases who were ostracized and separated from society. Okay? Everybody okay with that? All right. So what we get in these three, the three synoptic gospels is three accounts of Jesus encountering a leper. Okay. And in them, we get three really distinct, even though there's an underlying theme that runs through all three, there are three distinct looks at how Jesus responded to that and interacted with that individual. Okay. So, he is, Matthew says he's coming down off of the mountain. Right, we are at the end in Matthew's account. We're at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. All of that has been done. Jesus has come down. He's still being followed by multitudes, right? Because in Matthew chapters five, six, and seven are all Sermon on the Mount related. Okay, so he's coming down, and as he comes down, this individual who is separated from society comes to Jesus, and what is his first reaction? Right. And this is, this is the first thing that is common to all three accounts. In all three accounts, the leper does what? First of all, first and foremost, he worships, he worships Jesus, right? Now, they, they each say it a little bit different, right? Um, Matthew says... A leper came and worshiped him. Mark says he kneeled down, right? 
but they're all a symbol of worship. And he says then secondly, which is common to all of them, I know you can do it. So if you're willing, make me clean. Okay. So, so what does this leper have in common with all of the demons that we just dis- talked about in all of the other events? He knows who the Christ is, doesn't he? Now, interesting enough, though, right, at that point in time, right, making him, cleansing him would have been something that only God could do. So coming from an Old Testament, moving into this period, we're still in, you know, right? So it's only something that God could do. So this leper is saying to us in all three of these accounts that he understands that Christ has the authority of God. Christ can do whatever God can do. Because he says, if you're willing, I know you can cleanse me. And then what does Jesus do? He cleanses him, right? It's interesting, though, that we read his first reaction in each of the accounts. So in Matthew, it says, then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, he cleansed. In Mark, he says, Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand. Yeah, well, in both, right? And then Luke says, then he put out his hand and touched him. So Mark says what? He was moved with compassion. Now, interesting enough, if you go, and maybe I can, I know how busy you are, but maybe this week, but on Mark, to meet some Greek Look, because the the, uh, Greek word for compassion and the Hebrew word that are used here uh, can also be translated as he became very angry. He he became very angry. Now, if we were to take that translation, which the NIV and the NRSV, they go, you know, they've all gone away from that. And and they're showing a compassionate Christ here. But if you look at it from that perspective, it changes that it changes for me what Mark is trying to tell us. When the leper comes to Jesus, he becomes angry. And then we ask ourselves, why? Why would Jesus be angry? And then if we want to put it into context of his compassion, we would say, Jesus became angry because why would an individual have to be separated and ostracized just because they had a skin disease? So so in his compassion boils into anger that people are treated the way they're being treated because that's not the way that Jesus tells us we treat people, is it? So in his compassion, he heals. And then maybe even further, we can look at his anger in in context of what happens. So what does he do after? In all three accounts, he says, and I don't think, yes, it does, and even in Luke, he says to the leper, go directly to the priest." And, and make the sacrifice that Moses commanded you make, right? So if, we, if you were to go back to Leviticus or go back to Deuteronomy, right, there's going to be there that says, if you are cleansed, and there are all kinds of things that you're cleansed from, right? But if you are cleansed, you, go, you, you weren't immediately welcomed back into the church. Right? You couldn't go to the synagogue just because you were clean now. This individual couldn't walk into the synagogue just because their skin disease was gone. Right? They had to go to the priest, and they had to go through a cleansing ritual, right? And it that amounted to several days of cleansing as well as a sacrifice. And then what happens? 
then they are a person of standing in the synagogue, right? So what all three of our gospel writers tell us, right, are information we need to know about the Christ and that they are all telling first century Christians about Jesus, right? First of all, he came for everybody. He didn't come just for people that are clean. He didn't just come for the righteous, right? He comes for everybody. Secondly, he is adherent to the law. It's important, right? Because we're going to read in the next five or six chapters of each of these gospel accounts, all the things that Jesus tells his disciples to do that the, the lawyers are saying is not right. That's against the law, right? That's so all these gospel writers want us to know. No, 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 no. Jesus is all about the law, right? And that's why he tells the leper, do all the things that the law tell you you have to do. Okay? Matthew ends with that. Matthew's good with that statement. For Mark and Luke, they want it to be more. And they say, but that's not what happens. This individual does not go directly to the priest. This individual does what? This individual goes on and tells the world. And when he tells the world, what happens? The crowds get bigger. Jesus can't go into town anymore because the crowds are so big. Right. And for Luke, for Luke, it gives us that transition from Galilee to Jerusalem. Because okay. you remember in 4, it says after he left Peter's house, he went to Judea. And then we jump back to the land. Right. Now he says... Crowds were so large that he had he couldn't go into the cities. Once again, in Luke, it says to us, and he would often withdraw into the wilderness and pray. Okay. Our time of solitude. Okay. All right. Any question about the leper? No. All right. We're going to stop there. Um, we're going to pick up next week in Matthew nine. We're going to talk about the forgiveness. We're going to next week. We're going to have a couple of fun things, right? We're going to talk about Jesus' ability to forgive sins, not just heal anymore, right? We're moving into a new stage of his ministry, and we're going to talk about tax collectors, right? All right. So it's always fun. To, you know, it's going to be very fitting. We'll almost be tax day, although tax day is now a month later. But yeah, right. So. Uh, we're going to talk about tax collectors next week. Okay. So any other, um, any other questions, comments? Okay. Uh, let me say that I am glad everybody was here today. Let me also um, stop this. Okay. We'll keep recording through the prayer. Um, Linda. First of all, let me, um, let me just reiterate, um, when we're starting on the 21st, not this week, but next Wednesday, we're starting a new Wednesday night study. Uh, it's going to be Adam Hamilton's The Walk is the title of it. Um, we're also going to set it up as a small group. So it's going to be, it's going to be videoed and ready to go for small groups to use. If you want to start a small group, uh, start a small group and you'll have all the teaching materials you need to do that. And what we're going to do is take Adam Hamilton's The Walk, and we're going to tie it into our five-star participant. It talks about why we as Christians are called to do those five things. Yeah, that was the way. Okay, this is called The Walk. And it talks about why we are called right, to serve, to follow, to give, to invite. So we're going to take what he's got in his video, and then I'm going to add to it to get to where we are at Bear Creek in our program. So, uh, you know, if you, don't, if you want to start a small group, that'd be wonderful. Just let me know, and we'll get everybody set up so they can get access and get a Zoom account, and do whatever. Um, and if not, join us on Wednesday night. So.
Okay. Um, Ron, are you getting books this week? Ron, are you getting books for the study? Anyone? No. Anyone at home? Okay. Um, then let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. And we thank you that Jesus walked down to the shore and called humans, beings, men, women, to give up what they had, walk away from what they had, and follow you. We ask that you come into our hearts, that you presence come upon each of us so that we too will follow with all of our heart and all of our soul and do all the things that you call us to do. For we know that when you call us, that if we trust and we obey, the nets will be full. We ask that you answer the prayers that we've spoken today and those that we haven't. Most importantly, Lord, we ask that your presence come upon each and every one of us as we go forth from wherever we are in your world. In your son's name we pray. Thank you, everybody. See you next week. Yes, ma'am. Ron.